a number of economists and investment advisors have dismissed Bitcoin, most likely without first gaining much technical understanding. Some have invoked the teachings of the Austrian school, such as Mises' regression theorem of money and the frequent use of the word commodity in the monetary writings of Karl Minger, Murray Rothbard, and others. I can sympathize with this. In the old story, precious metals were good, fixed rate money substitutes were okay, and fiat money was bad. Now comes Bitcoin, not fitting anywhere. It has no physical substance, so it's not a commodity money. It does not substitute at a fixed rate for uh, any other uh, physical substance, so it's not a money substitute. And it has certainly never been decreed to be an official monetary unit of a state, so it's not a fiat money. So what is it? I will now suggest uh, several ways to approach this interpretive challenge, one new and some old. Part of the challenge of money is that people need to be able to agree that a given specimen really is one of the units that is supposed to be. One person might think the paper he has is a dollar. Another might discover it is a counterfeit. One person might think she has a solid gold bar. Another one might discover that it's actually tungsten with some gold covering on it. In both cases, there is some basis on which people can agree that a given specimen is or is not a valid example of the unit. It is possible for many different people to agree that something uh, is or is not a certain way based on some common standards of evidence that anyone can check. I call this quality intersubjective agreeability. This extends beyond unit authenticity and counterfeiting to general public understandings of how changes to the aggregate stock of a given type of money unit come about and impact exchange values. With precious metal coins, such understandings were based on fields such as metallurgy, coinage, and testing methods. These worked to make counterfeiting individual coins and debasing all such coins harder to hide. The same goes for fiat money, but in a different way. Here we understand that counterfeiters will be prosecuted and that central bank committees control the aggregate production of new units based on their legislated authority. Bitcoin accomplishes the same social functions in an entirely new way. What was done with chemistry and metallurgy and later with legislative power and threats is now done with an open source protocol for a peer-to-peer -peer network engaged in cryptographic verification using proof of work. That is the technical pieces I talked about in part two. Compared to previous methods, Bitcoin appears to have overcome the problem of counterfeiting almost entirely. And it defeats the threat of arbitrary inflation by specifying the aggregate stock of units within the definition of what kind of unit a Bitcoin is, a 21 millionth of the total possible theoretical stock of all Bitcoin. The use of the word, the use of the word commodity in Austrian monetary theory has been invoked against the theoretical legitimacy of Bitcoin. But were the Austrian greats using this word mainly to specify goods that were tangible as opposed to intangible? Or was tangibility just an incidental aspect of the examples they had in mind? I argue that it was more of the latter. 
One point to consider is that Karl Menger's 1892 paper on the origins of money cited commodity markets such as for cotton and grain as examples to explain his concept of relative saleability. With most goods, he explained, buyers and sellers are in quite different positions. At one extreme, if one wants to buy a special instrument, one can just go to a specialty store and buy it. But to turn around and sell it again right away is much harder. Even if one can sell it at all, the price will probably have to be much lower. In a commodity market, the relative positions of buyers and sellers are much more equal. Compared to shopping for non-commodity items, one can either buy or sell at the current market price just as well. In this sense, Menger explained, money is the most saleable good of all. Its price against other goods tends to be either the same or very similar, whether one is buying or selling. His concept of relative saleability was central to his account of the market evolution of medium of exchange, media of exchange, and then money out of commonly traded commodities. He wrote, with the extension of traffic in space and with the expansion, expansion over ever longer intervals of time and provision for satisfying material needs, each individual would learn from his own economic interests to take good heed that he bartered his less saleable goods for those special commodities which displayed beside the attraction of being highly saleable in the particular locality, a wide range of saleableness in both time and place. These wares would be qualified by their costliness, which I think means value per weight, easy transportability, and fitness for preservation or durability to ensure to the possessor a power not only here and now, but as nearly as possible unlimited in time and space generally over all other market goods. That sounds to me a little like Bitcoin. But this was written nearly 120 years before. Now that's good science fiction. In the debate over whether Bitcoin should be labeled as money or not, much depends on the specific technical definitions one has in mind. In examining these debates,